Welcome to r slash malicious compliance, where we share stories of people conforming to the letter but not the spirit of request. And today we have four great stories, so subscribe, hit the like button, and let's begin. The first story. Teacher hindered my efforts, but I surpassed peers with minimal effort, surprising everyone with an outstanding project. The second story. New apron rule enforced. Staff complied by exploiting it, causing a firing and earning me recognition. The third story. My brother's company enforced office return for all, ignoring remote team differences. He cleverly exposed their penny pinching, spending more on unnecessary headset. The first story is... Teacher says I can't use Java to write an Android app? Okay then. Before getting into the MC, there's a bit of backstory here. During my sophomore year of high school, I took a dual credit Visual Basic programming class for funsies, and I enjoyed it so much. I decided then and there that my major was going to be directly related to computer programming. So when my high school counselor told me they were offering an AP computer science class during junior year, I signed up immediately, only to be told a few months later that there wasn't enough student interest. I was bummed, but they told me to wait until the next year. I did, and they canceled the class again for the same reason. Instead, they decided to offer a computer science principles class, which would be in beta, would be targeted at all high schoolers as a sort of intro to CS course, and would eventually become an AP class, they hoped. I was skeptical, but I figured another programming class wouldn't hurt. Enter my first day of senior year 2014. I attend this class and realize that the instructor is pretty brand new to teaching high school students. It's his first year in the district. He's a passive aggressive man, but he has enough experience from the field that I figured I would have to learn at least one or two things from his lectures. Besides, I wanted to get as many scholarships as I was eligible for, so if I gave him the benefit of the doubt, maybe he'd be a useful contact for me, right? So we became friends, in that I would try to help other students try to connect with his class. Most of them didn't care. They got thrown in just because someone wanted to make up numbers, and in return he tried to talk to me a bit more about the ever-developing field of CS. But during that first semester, the only concept I ever learned was abstraction, as I knew everything else from my visual basic class. So it was mostly a waste of time for me, but I really tried to stick it out and help this teacher where I could. Towards the end, we finally stopped talking about control structures and pseudocode and started using the SNAP language, which was useful for some people in the class, but for most, they weren't really excited about it. I wasn't too keen on using it myself, but I figured it was a useful illustration for his lessons. Still, I tried to keep everyone on the same page. Then came the second semester, and the teacher announces that we would be building an Android mobile app for our semester-long project. I was thrilled because I would get to really code something awesome again. So on the sheet of paper he had us write our grand idea on, I scribbled out that I wanted to create a music visualizer that would change both foreground and background colors and movement speed based on BPM, and that the user would be able to change settings inside the app, etc. And then he mentioned that we were only going to use the MIT App Inventor 2 software to create this app, and upon his demonstration, my hopes sank. It was essentially the Snap language, a drag-and-drop language hosted on a website, with a few extra flares, but it was nowhere close to the power, flexibility, and overall ability to use the coding skills that I had learned in Visual Basic. He also said that we'd be doing checkups every week, to see how our progress was going, etc. This piece will be slightly important to note. So I asked him after class, listen, teacher's name, you know that I could do much more than this website provides. You've seen my work. You know I took Visual Basic. Please let me write my app in a language that I could use in the future like Java. And for whatever reason, maybe he didn't want to play favorites. Maybe he wanted to set his foot down. He said, sorry, Jack Knock, but I want everyone here to use this software to make this app. I smiled and said, okay because in that moment he lost what respect my somewhat introverted yet overly edgy teenage self had held for him. Cue the MC. From that point on, I went from being his star student to just giving my bare minimum in class every day. I went from trying to keep his students focused in class to using the very Google Docs page he was teaching us on to help host a giant group chat where we essentially disregarded everything he was saying. But I was still determined to be an A student that year, so I did everything I was absolutely required to, no less, no more. Thus, as his specifications for the app were very minimal, during every checkup I would intentionally degrade my app's hypothetical functionality by saying things like, well, you know, I really thought long and hard about adding music, but the API just didn't seem to function appropriately, and all the necessary techno babble that drew a pained look from my instructor. 
After all, it was completely within his guidelines for me to continue to remove things that weren't working from my app. But the truth was I spent maybe 10 minutes in total actually testing the items I knew I wasn't going to have in the final build. This happened every week, to his increasing dismay. I enjoyed myself. Him? Not so much. About two weeks before the deadline to present my app, he had had enough of my shenanigans and announces that we had to finalize the plans for our projects. So I started helping other people with their code, which was me leaving my station to fix someone's broken puzzle piece, and then casually chat with them for about 10 minutes. The teacher picked up on this and had me stay at my station. Fine. I start doing homework for more important classes while waiting for the class period to end. No big deal. About one week before the deadline, I actually started working on my app, now entitled Simple is Better, as a nod or middle finger depending on your perspective to the only things I learned from his class, the concept of abstraction, and my feelings about using this dumbed down software. It was essentially a cookie cutter clicker game clone, with a diamond as the cookie to click. The goal was to unlock about seven different backgrounds. A far cry from my original idea, but I used what I was given. He was visibly frustrated with my project's new mission, as he expected more from me than what boiled down to a splash screen that led to a loop with pictures. I just smiled and said okay. The presentation day came, and I double-checked my work, cracked my fingers, and downloaded the APK file for the app. Our software didn't allow you to go backwards from this stage, so it was essentially a sealed deal. Now when it came to presentation, we had test devices, a series of LG Volt devices that couldn't leave the room, that we were supposed to run our app on. Not only did my app run on those, the app ran smoothly on my personal device, a Huawei Prism. So I was set, and in my smug satisfaction, I let the others in the class present first. To my teacher's quiet horror, none of the other classmates were able to successfully run their app. Some crashed on launch, some had a black screen, and some were stuck showing the code they couldn't get to run. And for the last but not least approach, I walked up, presented my app on both my test and personal phones, and my instructor had no choice but to give me the A I needed to complete my master collection of A's that year, as he couldn't afford to grade me and everyone else harshly. It was his first year after all. We haven't talked since that day. Rumor is he no longer works at that district, and I now wish I gave him less grief over something so small. But that's what happens when passive aggressiveness meets aggressively passive, I suppose. Edit. I understand its purpose. For kids in elementary school, it helps them understand that you can't just place any code in willy-nilly and expect it to work. But once you've successfully used modules of code that you've had to meticulously type in and recheck its parameters, there's something just draining about being forced to go backwards, to drag and drop puzzle pieces again. In hindsight, maybe we should have tried to use Arduinos or Raspberry Pi starter kits, but hey, it's not like I wrote the curriculum. The next story is... Restaurant MC from my days is a minimum wage worker. So I used to work in a mom and pop coffee shop and restaurant that made everything from scratch. I mean everything. If my boss could afford chickens, he would have the kitchen staff pluck the feathers. I had been working there for about a year, and I loved working there. The work was hard, but I loved to cook, especially because of all of it was homemade. We didn't have chef coats, at least at that time. And the only required piece of clothing for a kitchen slave, me, was a typical apron that businesses can order from linen companies and have replaced every week with fresh ones. Life was good until an investor to the store asked my boss, and owner of the store, we'll call him R, if R can employ her, we'll call her B, to help out because B knows R loves to short staff the store. R decides the best job for B is general manager. We had never had a general manager at the store. One of my coworkers that had been there since the place opened even said that a GE had never been a position. This is important because B was a music teacher in elementary school by trade, now retired. I guess that's why she wanted a job because she was bored. Needless to say, it was a complete disaster having someone who never even worked in a kitchen that served hundreds of people a day now running it basically. B would constantly tell people they were doing things wrong, probably to look like she was doing something, even though she had no idea what was going on. She even went as far as to add things to the employee manual just to get her way, such as conduct clauses, reparations for arguing with her, etc. Eventually, she decides the aprons we're required to wear must be clean and free from grime and muck at all times. This was added to the handbook, and that meant every time we got something on our apron, we had to change the apron for a fresh one. Being a from-scratch kitchen, this became annoying very quickly. After a while, R decided to ask the kitchen to be neater, Yes, neater, so he didn't have to order more aprons as much because the service was expensive, and he was barely making money as is. We all reminded him of B's new apron rule and R said, follow that but still try not to be as messy. 
Reminder, this is still a kitchen and I'm making minimum wage, so SH happens, you know? Eventually, B enforced the rules so hard that she would threaten points on an employee's record if the rule wasn't followed to a T. This angered all of us, and I decided I had had enough. At one of our employee hangouts, I got everyone on board to replace their aprons as frequently as possible, to the point where we would almost purposefully be messy, or not as careful with things so we would have to change our aprons. My personal record was seven times in one four-hour shift. It got to the point where R had aprons delivered to the store three times a week, and all the employees were now friends with the linen delivery driver, and he thought our shenanigans were hilarious. Stick it to the man, man, is a quote I'll remember for the rest of my life. Eventually, R caught on to what we were doing and had B fired, because of how much money and turmoil her rules were costing R, and then everything went back to normal. The third story is... Management saving pennies by throwing away pounds. My brother's company has asked their staff to return to the office for a minimum of three days a week. He understands, it makes sense for those in central departments, but he works in an offshore office with three other colleagues, none of whom do the same job. Think of it as boss brother, local admin support, local engineering, local marketing. Since they work from home, they've talked on the phone fewer than 10 times and met in person no more than twice. They work in different departments and don't really need to talk to each other now that everything's online. The company are insistent that it's one rule for all, except for the senior manager who decided to move out of their head office into a different country. She's exempt because she's moved, apparently. Anyway, the whole ordeal annoyed my brother, but being the good guy he is, he relented as long as his team got to return to the office kit that everybody else got. Namely headsets, an extra laptop charger, and a locker. Well, his company decided not to supply lockers. He quoted their one rule for all back to his senior manager and was told no. Central London is expensive, so you must make do with your kit. The new downsized office is what you have, take it or leave it. The US staff following their senior manager's lead realized that she'd bought a wireless headset because it was easier to transport on her flights back to the country she lived in, so they'd all been given wireless headsets too. Again, he asked for wireless headsets but was told no. The rule is wired headsets. My brother is a very patient man. He has two younger sisters, and we didn't make his childhood easy, so I get this part. He's also someone you never want to peeve off because he's very happy to go full sin to make a point. Whilst he's only got a team of four, including himself, he's the most senior UK employee, totaling about 60 people. He agreed to wired headsets because if he could request some appropriate periphery to go along with them, he waited until he got an approved email from his seniors until he put his plan into action. 60 times wireless headsets were about 47 pounds each and came with a case. 60 times wired headsets were about 30 pounds each. 60 times headset cases were 10 pounds each. 60 times Apple Lightning to 3.5 millimeter adapters were 8 pounds each. The company phones are iPhones and don't have 3.5 millimeter adapters. 60 times large health and safety compliant backpacks were about 42 pounds each. 60 times spare 3.5 millimeter cables were about 2 pounds each. The company could have spent 2,820 pounds on wireless headsets to keep their offshore staff happy. They ended up spending over double that, 55, 20 pounds, and then complained that the wired headsets were too expensive. The newest UK hires are being issued with wireless headsets, and my brother's now looking to return all the wired headsets and obtain wireless headsets for commonality and functional purposes. I don't think he'll follow through on that at the moment, but if he gets any more complaints, then I'm sure next time I see him for a drink, he'll be wearing a wireless headset. Edit. Sadly, the company seems to have been there, done that. They don't need webcams on, but they need to prove they're in the office one way or another. I don't understand the full details, but it seems they're pretty clever at working out ways. Their favorite seems to be checking their printer logs. I hope you enjoyed these stories. Don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe to the channel.